Okay, so uh, let me start. So are there any questions from the other lectures? So just curiosity, how many people uh, were able to do the exercises? So the first exercise was to derive the, the constraints, the Virozoa constraints from the Nambu-Goto action. So there was anybody unable to do it? So curiosity, how many people tried to do it? Okay, so about half. And what about the second exercise about getting the equations of motion, Maxwell equations of motion from BRST? How many people tried to do it? And how many people succeeded to do it? Did you, were you able to do it? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so. <laughs> I don't know, a suggestion, so do you have homework? You normally you don't have homework sessions in these things. It's a suggestion too. <laughs> so you could even have discussion sessions in the afternoon where people discuss the homework. So, I mean the people, uh, but it means that people have to try to do the homework and then they discuss it during the <laughs> discussion <laughs> session. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll start where I uh, finished yesterday with the spinning particle. And then I'll gauge um, E equals 1 and chi equals 0. So then this becomes um, I'm not sure about the sign, but it's probably minus 1 half. And then you have the ghosts. So you have the ghosts coming from the bosonic Lagrange multiplier, which are fermionic, and the ghosts coming from the fermionic Lagrange multiplier, which are bosonic. Um, if you want, so this action is, of course, BRST invariant, um, where Q is. So this term comes from the fact that this constraint squared is p squared. And if you want, you can show that actually this action has something called supersymmetry. So it's supersymmetry in one dimension. It's not, yes? When you were Oh, sorry, in the action. Sorry, so this is Q. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. So when, when, when you gauge fix, so the, the term coupling to the ghosts has a term B, um, then you have an operator here. And the operator is DDT, or DD tau, and then there's a term plus F, uh, if you have it, Offhand, you can tell me what it is. What, um, um, F K L. So this is up index E tilde L. Okay. Um so my indices are wrong. J J this one should be sorry. I'm gonna write just two terms, so I don't get confused. J 
Okay. So this is the term you're talking about. Okay, so in this case, um, e tilde k, so f j k l is only non-zero if you have, um, if k is in the gamma direction, right? So um, if k is in the gamma direction, this would give you a term like um, b gamma times e tilde k. e tilde k, k in this case is in the gamma direction. So e tilde k in the gamma direction is chi. So this becomes chi tilde, but we gauge chi tilde equals zero. Okay. So in, in if you didn't gauge chi equals zero, then yes, it'd be a term here coupling to the, this would be the world line gravitino. Okay, other questions? Yeah, so, so if, you if you can compute propagators, so if you can invert the kinetic terms, then the gauge choice is fine. So if you don't gauge fix enough, then you won't be able to define the propagator for the matter fields. If you gauge fix too much, you won't be able to define the propagator for the ghosts. Any other questions? Okay, so we have the, um, so in fact, this can be written with manifest world line supersymmetry if you want. This is just a side comment, but uh, for people who know about supersymmetry in one dimensions, you can combine x and psi into a superfield. It depends on tau and kappa, and then you can find something like this, x m. And then this term here is just um, and you can also write the the second term. I think I did this right. Yes, is there a question? Um, right, you can also write the second term if you combine B and C into superfield. So you define C to be equal to C plus kappa gamma and um, B to be equal to beta plus kappa B. And then you can also write the second term as something like, um, I think it's B C dot. Maybe there's also a term DB, DC, I don't remember. Something like this with some coefficient. So um, this is just a side comment for people who know about um, these this type of writing actions. Okay, so um, we want to compute the cohomology. So the generic state, we already um, discussed it. Because of the psi, it has an alpha index. So we can write it as, um, we can write the general term as um, phi zero alpha x, then we can have c phi 1, and we could also have a gamma. So these both have ghost number 1, so let's call this phi tilde. So if this we define to be fermionic, then this would be bosonic, and this would be fermionic, right? So because this is bosonic. And then you can keep going, so you could have c gamma phi 2 plus c plus gamma squared by tilde 2 <coughs> So we have all these terms. Okay, so what does QV equals 0 imply? So any questions up to now? Do people remember what this alpha index is? So alpha goes from 1 to 32. And psi acting on V alpha is just gamma M alpha beta V beta. So Q has these terms here. So QV is just going to be equal to, when acting on this, it gives you C box phi zero alpha. So that's from this term. Then from this term, it gives you gamma 
d slash phi zero, where d slash is is d d x m contracted with the gamma matrix. This term doesn't contribute because the b uh, annihilates this when acting on the ground. So on here, the, the last term does contribute, so it gives you plus gamma squared phi one. That's this term acting on this. And then you get terms like C box phi 1 alpha and, c sorry, um, there's no term here because the C kills the C. Okay, so there's no term like that. But there is a term C gamma P slash phi 1 alpha. Then from this term you get C box phi 1 tilde alpha. Then you get gamma squared d slash phi tilde alpha in here. And this term kills it because, again, b kills it. Okay, and then keep going. Okay, any questions? Yes? Ask it again. Why can't you do uh, Yes? Oh, because the gamma matrices are 32 by 32. No, um, so there's a... So the gamma matrices you can write in vial representation as... Um, so maybe... I'm trying to remember what letters I use in the next part of my talk. Well, let's call it A and B. Okay, so... So there's vial and anti-vial representations, but the gamma matrix transforms vial into anti-vial. So this is a 32 by 32 matrix, which yes, you can write as the, just like um, gamma matrices in four dimensions are four by four. So yes, you can write them in terms of Pauli matrices, which are two by two, but, but the gamma matrices, if you want this gamma matrix, you have the usual anti-commutation relation, oh, eight and n. These should be 32 by 32. Hmm. So um, it's just like Pauli matrices. So, um, so uh, different people use different notation. I usually, so this notation is bad because I wrote gamma both, w both sides. So just l in order to be, um, less confusing, let me call this capital gamma. So the capital gamma matrices are 32 by 32, and this alpha index can either be a vial or anti-vial. But you have to have both because um, the gamma matrix takes vial into anti-vial. So, so if, if V is vial and you hit on it with a gamma matrix, it will become anti-vial. So sometimes you write this as a down index or up index, but that's, I mean, that's just notation. Okay. So this representation has uh, all 32 components. It turns out in the spinning string, you truncate, but I don't know if that's what, uh, that's another point that's confusing. Um, so we're still on the spinning particle. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm calling too many things gamma. This gamma is the ghost. Okay. Yeah. Normal means it's commuting, if that's what you mean by normal. Okay. No, it's not. So it's not. It's not as normal as x. So it can only appear polynomially. So 1 over gamma doesn't make sense. So um, it's commuting, but um, it's not, um, how can I say it? What's the best way to say it? So it carries ghost number, 
Um, and you want your states to have integer ghost number. In fact, yeah. So if you tried to invert gamma, then you would have problems. So you, you wouldn't. The cohomology wouldn't make sense if you allow one over gammas. So yes. Here, yeah. yep. So this term, if I hit it with gamma squared b. So gamma squared b is an operator. It acts on c phi 1. So this you should think of as a wave function. So if you like, you can think of it as acting on a ground state where b annihilates the ground state. So you pull the b through the c. Or another way to think about it is just b is like ddc. So this is, this is the conjugate. So it just takes a derivative with respect to c. Any other questions? Okay, so we want to set this to zero. So clearly that implies that box phi zero equals zero and that d slash phi zero equals zero. So we get box. So those are the terms here which have ghost number one. Then there are terms with ghost number two. And now you can see you can get the cancellation. So this tell doesn't tell you that phi one equals zero. It tells you that phi one is equal to d slash phi tilde. Uh, maybe with a minus sign. So these two terms cancel. And it's easy to see that if you do... Question? Oh, this is zero, sorry. Um, this equation here also implies that this cancels this. Right? Because... I'm oh sorry, that this cancels this. Because you hit with another d slash, d slash squared is just box. So this equation, this should have been d slash. This automatically cancels this if this is equal to this. So this is the, the equation for phi 1. And you'll, if you keep going, you'll get similar equations. Phi 2 alpha is equal to minus d slash phi 2 tilde alpha, etc. So now you want to compute the cohomology. So this is QV equals zero. What about the image? So we want to consider what's delta V alpha is Q of omega. So let's say omega is equal to then again you can have omega zero, you can have omega one. Omega tilde one, etc. So when you hit Q on omega, you'll get a term C box omega zero alpha. Then you'll get a term C gamma. Oh sorry, you get a term gamma d slash w0. I should have put this index up. I don't know why I put it down. I mean, you can raise in lower indices because there's 32 component objects. Right? Okay, so we have this. Then we have c gamma d slash w1. Then you have gamma squared w1. Again, that's from this term acting on this. Then you get C gamma box W tilde 1 and gamma squared D slash W tilde 1. Okay, so from this we can figure out how the phi's are affected, right? So we find out that Delta phi zero equals zero. That doesn't change under any transformation. But we find that delta phi one gets a contribution from here. 
and delta phi 1 tilde gets a contribution from from here right? so we find delta phi 1 equals box w0 delta phi tilde 1 is d slash of And similarly, if I go to phi 2, okay, you'll get more. Okay. So, so obviously <coughs> phi 0, the cohomology of phi 0, these are the equations of motion. D slash phi 0 equals 0 implies box phi 0 equals 0. So the equation of motion for phi 0 is just D slash, just the massless Dirac equation. Okay, so phi 0 describes a massless spin 1 half. Okay, what about phi 1? So this equation here tells me that phi 1 is determined once I know phi tilde 1. So I really only have to look at phi tilde 1. So phi tilde 1, the only equation, so it doesn't satisfy any equations because this just tells me what phi 1 is in terms of phi tilde 1, but it does have this gauge symmetry. So the gauge symmetry is delta phi tilde 1 alpha is equal d slash of w0 alpha. So what we want to know is, what do the fields here, which cannot be written as d slash w0, so that's a state in the cohomology. If it can be written as d slash w0, then we know that it can be removed from the cohomology. Okay, so that's... So let's suppose that d slash, so I want to wha what I want to prove is that the cohomology is just d slash phi tilde equals zero. Okay, so let's suppose d slash phi tilde one. So first of all, let's um, say that this is non-zero. Okay. So we want to show they can always be written in this form. Okay, so if we hit it with d slash, then this implies that p squared of phi tilde one is non-zero, right? Uh, not quite. Um, so it implies, well, let, let's see. That was too fast. Um, let's suppose that it's an eigenvalue of p squared. Then, then, uh, then it's true. So um, uh, I'm doing this too fast. Let's see. So let's suppose let's suppose that p squared. So let's first prove that p squared of phi tilde one has to be zero. Suppose it's not zero. So suppose that p squared doesn't annihilate phi tilde one. Then certainly p slash. Phi, then I can write. Okay. Then that implies you can write phi tilde one is equal to p slash of um, h. So let's suppose these two things are not are not zero. Okay, so p slash phi tilde one is not zero, and p slash phi tilde one is not zero. So this, of course, not now uh, what I claim is that these two equations imply that you can always write phi tilde one is p slash of something. So here I've done it. I've just used the fact. So h is any Is any direction such that h dot p is non-zero? Um, sorry. No, I'm not. I'm going too fast. Sorry. Sorry, I did this in my head without doing it on paper. Oh. Better even like that. The first, you're saying the second? Not quite, because suppose this is something that's annihilated by p slash. Then, um, um, let's see. 
So if this is not zero, so if this is zero, then certainly it implies p squared of it is zero. But if it's not zero, it doesn't imply it. Okay, but let's suppose both of these are true. Okay, so then you can write phi tilde one in this way. So this is equal to p squared of phi tilde one. Since p squared is non-zero, then of course, uh, if I just divide by p squared, now I've written phi tilde one is p slash of w zero. So if I just call this object w zero, then I've proved that this is not in the cohomology. So what I've proved is that um, if both of these are non-zero, I can remove it by a gauge transformation. Okay, now what I want to prove is that, um, well what I really want to prove is that the only way you can't remove it is if p slash phi tilde one equals zero. So I haven't proven that yet. Um, but, okay, I did it in my head. I'll, I'll, after the break, I'll do it. Okay, so what I've proved at least is that um, if both of these are non-zero, then it's not in the cohomology. So what, th what I want to prove is that cohomology is just p slash phi tilde one equals zero, which of course also implies that p squared phi tilde one. So I want to prove that phi tilde one has the same cohomology as phi zero. So I, I almost proved it, but I, I didn't quite prove it. Okay, now um, it turns out that if you compute delta phi tilde two, you get precisely the same th equation. You get no equations coming from qv equals zero, but you get a gauge transformation of the same type as before. So you get an infinite set of these uh, cohomologies. So you get an infinite set of fields, all which satisfy p slash equals zero. Of course, the only physical one is this one here. I mean, that's the one you want to identify with the massless spinner. Um, but you get these infinite copies. So you don't, get, you don't just get one copy as we had before. OK. Um, I think I know the proof. So, okay, I'll, I'll check it during the during the break, just so I don't mess up again. Okay, um, are there any questions about this? Uh, let me do it after the break. I'll give the proof. So, the the, the thing that that I'm missing is that I've shown that um, they both have to be non-zero in order to gauge it. If they both are non-zero, you can gauge it away. But let's say just one of them is non-zero. I haven't proved that you can gauge it away. What I want to prove is that, that um, the only way you can't gauge it away is if they both are zero. So, so there, there are different possibilities, right? You could have both of them being non-zero. You could have one of them being zero and one of them non-zero. And you could have both of them zero. This one, certainly you cannot gauge away. But I haven't shown that if just one of them are zero, you, 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 you can gauge it away. Okay? So that I'll show after the break. Um, okay, so um, so this is the cohomology for the spin one half. Okay, the next thing we want to do is generalize just to the string. So we're going to do something similar to what we did for the bosonic, but um, as I think you saw with with Augustus talk. When you do for the string, there are different kinds of size you can introduce depending on the different boundary conditions. So we want to generalize this to the string. So now we're going to integrate over tau and sigma as we did before for the bosonic. And as before, we have p plus x prime squared here. But now you have to also add a term depending on psi. So the term you add is of this type. And if you want to do the closed string, 
you also have to introduce a second fermion. So if you're working in Minkowski space, these two would be independent. If you're working in Euclidean space, one would be the complex conjugate of the other. This would be P minus X prime. And instead of being plus, psi, psi bar is going to be minus. So again, the psi prime just means GD sigma psi. Finally, you have to add the Lagrange multiplier for the fermionic constraint. So in this case, it's going to be psi dot P plus X prime. And for the complex conjugate, it's going to be psi dot P minus X prime. Sidebar. Any questions about the action? Okay, so now, so I assume he talked about Neva Schwartz and Ramon, Augusto? Yes? Okay. So now we have different boundary conditions. Um, So the different boundary conditions are, if we're doing closed string theory, we can either have um, psi of sigma plus 2 pi equals plus or minus psi of sigma. So if it's plus plus, so this is Ramon over Schwartz. So you could either Ramon, Ramon, Ramon over Schwartz, over Schwartz, Ramon. If you're doing open strings, it's a little bit simpler. You have um, at the two ends of the strings, you have psi zero equals psi bar zero. So this is of course a vector. All the indices are the same. And depending if you're doing Ramon or over Schwartz, you have psi m of pi is equal to plus or minus psi bar of pi, where this, again, the plus is Ramon, the minus is never sure. Okay? So we want to compute the cohomology, and um, of course we know the spectrum is different in these different sectors, so we expect to get different cohomologies depending on either periodicity or boundary conditions. Okay. Okay, so we go through the same analysis as we did before. First, we gauge fix. So we gauge E equals E bar equals 1 and chi equals chi bar equals 0. And then um, we get the action simplifies to So these signs are chosen such that um, psi has a ddz bar and psi bar has a ddz. So again, ddz is dd tau plus sigma and ddz bar is dd tau minus sigma. And then you also get ghosts from here. So you get a set of left moving ghosts coming from these Lagrange multipliers and right moving coming from these. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, now we want to, um, it turns out this can also be written in, in superspace if you want. This can be written as there's similar terms here. I'm not going to write them. Where X now is a superfield 
It depends on tau and sigma, and it has two Grassmann parameters. And it has the form xm. And it turns out this field here, if you want, you can include it in the action, but it appears without any derivatives. So the equation of motion is just f equals 0. Okay, so um, this is the action, finally the BRST operator. So the BRST operator is d sigma. Now you have C times and then you get some ghost coupling. So you have gamma squared B in the same case like in the spinning in the spinning particle, but you get other terms. So for you get, for example, B, C, D, C, like you got in bosonic string, and you also get some terms like C, gamma, D, beta, plus D of gamma, beta. you get terms like this also, plus complex conjugate. Okay, so this is the BRST operator, and now we use the same method as we did in the bosonic string theory to compute the cohomology. Okay, any question? So now what we have to do is we have to uh, figure out the modes. So we have to define the ground state and see which, decide which modes annihilate the ground state. So we're going to have so let me keep this because I'll so the ground state is going to be annihilated by um, A minus N, where these come from the X's. Let's say the ones that come from the Psi's are B minus N. Ah, sorry, B is not a good letter. Let's call it, um, I don't know, Rho, or D, I think is what people usually use. And... Um, so this is zero for uh, let me do it let me do it individually so a minus n acting on the ground state equals zero for n positive or it equals zero for n negative okay so we're dividing x in the usual way is x tilde m plus um, a one m z so we're doing the same expansion in z as we did in the bosonic string then we have the c ghost and that's going to have the same expansion as we had before that starts with c minus one again because c has conformal weight minus one it comes from the same lagrange multipliers in the bosonic string So we'll define, for the C ghost, we'll define uh, C minus 2 to annihilate. And anything N less than minus 1. Okay, so these are the creation operators. Similarly, for the B ghost, we have the same as before. So B is B2 plus B3Z plus so BN for n less than 2. What about the psi's? So, so now we have to decide what the modes are for the psi's. So psi, first of all, has conformal weight 1 half. That's easy to read off from here because uh, the total conformal weight of this object has to be 2. And there's only one derivative, so each of these has to have conform weight to half. So that means that when you do your transformation and write psi rho in terms of psi of z, you get the factor of d rho dz to the one half. Now remember, d rho dz is equal to one over z. So this gives you a one over the square root of z. So that means you have an offset here. So um, psi m 
it could start off, for example, if the mode number was um, integer, it would start off with psi 0 over square root of z. Then the next one would be square root of z psi 1. I guess I'm calling it d. So we see that uh, psi has square root cuts if these are integer moded. If they're half integer moded, then uh, what you'll get is you get d um, one half plus uh, z d to the three halves, right? So this is the Ramon sector, because the Ramon sector, if we're doing the open string, has a plus sign here. So the modes are integer. If we're doing the Nova Schwartz sector, then the modes are half integer. So this is Ramon. Now, uh, so we want certainly um, d0. B, yeah, that's the way it usually, that's the way it usually is written in books. But I, I used B already, so oh, that's why. <laughs> um, so never short. So D minus a half, so D n for n less than a half. Now. The zero mode here acts in precisely the same way as the, the psi that I called in the spinning particle. So I'm going to treat the zero mode because the zero mode satisfies d0m with d0n is equal to a to mn. So I'm going to treat, in the Ramon sector, I'm going to treat the zero mode in the same way, I'm going to uh, say that it's a representation of D0 because it has a spinner index. Okay. okay, so these are, and of course I also have the beta gamma, sorry. So uh, if you do the computation, you find that um, gamma has conform weight minus a half. You can read that off from here, <coughs> which means that gamma, instead of starting out, again, it can either be integer or half integer moded. So um, it turns out that if um, gamma is in the Nova Schwartz Ramon sector, it satisfies the same boundary conditions or periodicity conditions as psi. So that's clear from here. If you want this object to be periodic, it's clear that this is anti-periodic when you go around this, the circle. This also has to be anti-periodic, and vice versa. So the boundary conditions of gamma are the same as psi. So if you're in the Ramon sector, it turns out that gamma is integer moded. It has, um, instead of having plus half, it has minus a half conformal weight. So it's going to shift in the other way. So you'll get um, gamma minus a half plus z gamma plus a half. And here it's going to start with gamma um, minus one. So at least in the Nova Schwartz sector, we're going to define gamma n on the ground state to be zero if n is less than minus a half. Okay. And similarly for beta. Beta is going to be for n less than three halves. Okay. okay, so these are the definitions of the modes. And now from this, with my BRST operator, I can again expand this in modes, and it would have helped if you had done this for the bosonic string. Uh, you can write down the, the spectrum. Okay. Okay, any questions?
Okay, so let's go ahead and and write down the spectrum. And we're going to start with the states with lowest mass level. Okay. So the things we can use on the ground state which have negative ends, we have the gammas and we have the Cs. So first of all, we have the ground state, so let's call it zero. So this, of course, has ghost number zero and it has k squared equals zero. So let's write, maybe I'll put it here. So these are the k squared equals zero states. Now you can have a k squared equals minus a half state, and you can even have a k squared equals minus one state. So the k squared minus one state is just c minus one acting on this, c minus one. You can also have gamma minus a half acting on these. So these are states which are just built out of the negative modes of the ghost. So this is in the Neverschwartz Schwartz sector first. And then, of course, there are many other things you can write down. So k squared equals 0, you can write down things like c minus 1, a1. You could also write down gamma minus a half, d a half. So both of these have ghost number 1. Then you can start to write things, well, there's one other thing you can write down, which is C0. Let's call it um, A, sorry, um, C0. Let's see. I, I think I'm not missing anything. So I think these are all the ghost number one things you can write down, which have k squared equals zero. So if I'm missing something, let me know. Yeah. Okay, I'm doing the never short sector first, but uh, so I'm just doing never short sector. Okay, so when we work in in the conformal gauge, this ground state here automatically has k squared equals zero. So it's the identity. If you think you can think of it as the identity. So there's no possibility of a shift when you work in this covariant gauge. If you work in Lycone gauge, um, there's a possibility of, of shifting the the ground state is really tachyonic, so there is a um, there is a shift you have to include. But when you work conformally, when you work in, in a conformal field theory, there's, there's no shift you can include. Okay. In both, in okay, so yeah, no, that's a good question. When we do the Ramon sec, so there's one ground state. So the ground state is the state which essentially, um, when we write the, the objects in terms of operators, the operator is the identity operator. That operator turns out to be in the Neverschwartz sector. Um, the reason why it's in the Neverschwartz sector is because um, it looks like the Ramon sector is simpler because the Ramon sector, you just have periodic or these uh, simple boundary conditions with a plus sign. But when you do your conformal transformation here, this d rho dz has square root cuts. So in fact, the things which are single valued or don't have square root cuts in the, in the complex plane is the never schwartz sector. And the identity operator is defined in the complex plane. So, um, so the identity operator is in the never schwartz sector. So if you try to write the Ramon states in terms of this never schwartz ground state, it's a mess, but you can do it. Okay, so uh, I'll, st I'll start to show how it's a mess, but you'll see that um, the shift of the Ramon, so the reason why the, um, the Ramon states have different mass level than the never schwartz states is because of this mess when you try to write the, the ground state in terms of the never schwartz I mean the Ramon sector in terms of the never schwartz ground state. You have to introduce spin fields and, and that makes life complicated. There was a question. I'm sorry? 
decompose. Yeah, uh, so this uh, I just didn't write it. So um, beta n equals 0 for n less than 3 halves. Okay, so, so these are some of the states. There's actually other states you could write down. You could write down also gamma minus a half squared. And you could also, of course, write gamma minus a half to any power you want. So you can get arbitrarily, states of arbitrarily low mass level, but just by hitting by enough gammas. It will turn out that none of these states will be in the cohomology. So, um, but okay, but if you want to just consider all the states before computing the cohomology, there are states of arbitrarily um, negative mass level. Okay, um, so these are the states up to ghost number one. Then you have ghost number two. You can just, for example, hit all the states with C0, so you can get things like this. So there are many things you can write down. Okay. It turns out the states in the cohomology will stop again at ghost number three. So at ghost number three, you can write down again the same thing as we wrote down in the bosonic string, this C minus one, C0, C1. But you can also write things involving the gammas. So for example, C0, gamma minus a half, gamma plus a half. That you can write down also. OK, so these are the states. Um, and now we have to compute the cohomology. Is there any question? Yeah? Um, yes. So you just take a k squared bigger than zero and just hit it with enough gamma minus a halves and yeah. But as you because gamma carries ghost number, these states will eventually have larger and larger ghost number. So um, so if we restrict to ghost number plus one, there aren't so many things we can write down. Okay, it will turn out that the physical states are the ones we identify with ghost number plus one. Okay, so now um, let me write these states in terms of the operator language, the same way as I did for bosonic string. So, for example, this state here is just the identity because there's nothing, there's nothing hitting on the ground state. This one here would be C because remember C at Z equals zero is just C minus one. And then you'll get DX M. This one here would be gamma. Because again, gamma starts with gamma minus a half. Or sorry, I'm calling it d minus a half. Sorry, what did I write down here? Oh yeah, you're right. Gamma starts with gamma minus a half. And then um, times psi. Because psi starts with, with d a half. Okay, this state here would be the derivative of c. right? Because it... Um, It's just the second term in, in this expansion. This one would be something like CDC DXM. Okay, so I'm doing a similar construction as I did before. And now connect, connected with each of these objects, I, I didn't write down the e to the ik dot x. But just as we did before, that can be encoded in, in this field. So this would be, um, let me call it lambda of x. This field, let's call, well, let me call it a prime. So these are both vectors. It will turn out in the cohomology, uh, there's only one of these states. Okay. This one would be a, a scalar. Okay, and essentially, there, and there are other terms here. So this object here is also of ghost number one, gamma minus a half. And this state is just going to be, um, let me write it over here. So this starts with just gamma, but um, since there's no, uh, uh, and then there's an e to the i k dot x, which I'll identify with the scalar field t of x. Okay, so these are some of the um, the operators which correspond to these states. Okay. You could also have this object here, so this would be c. Let's say it's multiplied times. We need another scalar, so let's call it um, 
t prime of x. Okay, so these are all the objects. Um, so right now we're just writing down everything we can write down, and now we're supposed to compute which of these are annihilated by q. Okay, so here's q. And the analysis is similar to what we did in the particle. So let's look at, um, okay, I guess we can start with this one. So this one, first of all, it has the property that when you ha hit it with Q, you get a contribution from here, right? Because the B doesn't annihilate the C. So if you hit this with Q, you're going to get You get something like gem squared t prime. So that means that if you don't have a term to cancel this, it means that t prime has to be zero, right? Because if gem squared t prime is zero, t prime is also zero. Okay, so this term drops out. What about this one? So now we have gamma t. So now the gem squared b term will kill it because there's no C's in it. Um, you'll get a contribution from here. So this will contribute C gamma box T. And you'll also get a contribution from here. So this beta is not going to commute with this gamma. So you'll get another contribution coming from here, which if you do the computation correctly is going to be something like plus C gamma times one half t or something like this. I'm not sure about the coefficient. So what you find is that the tachyon, I mean this state is annihilated by q if the field t satisfies the equation mission box plus one half equals zero. So it's a tachyon. So if this was a negative number then it would be a uh, massive state. No, I lied to you just now. Um, so there's something that I forgot to say, which is you still have this. Um, right. You still have this. So I did it too quickly. So this term here is going to give you the term plus gamma dx is like d dx. So dx, remember, is like p plus x prime. So the p is just like d dx. So this gives me a term gamma squared times psi m times dm of t. Now, if this is 0, that would naively imply that t has to be constant. So fortunately, there's a term that cancels that. So c minus 1 is, of course, if k squared equals minus 1. But you can write a term of this type, c minus 1 d a half m, which is at k squared equals minus a half, just like this one. So let's call this object um, oh sorry. Yeah. Let's call this object um, C psi m. It's a vector, so let's give it a vector index. Let's give it a, a vector, let's call it um, Bm. So this is an additional field, additional state that I didn't include just because I didn't write this down this term, but you also have to include that. So let's see how Q acts on this. Well, because this has a C, this term here is going to act. 
This term kills it because it already has the C, but this term will act on it, and it's going to give you uh, gamma squared psi m bm. Now you can also get a contribution from here. So this gives you the term plus C gamma. Now you have two psi, so you have psi m, you have a psi n, and finally you have a derivative here coming from the dx. So that's going to give you dn bm. So this is the computation of q on this. Kay? Now if you put these two together, you can get a cancellation of this term here with this term here. If I define bm is equal to dm of t. Right? Because if this is dm of t, this term can cancel this, and this term drops out. Why? Because um, this is anti-symmetric in m and n, so if this is the derivative of something, it drops out. So that means the state actually which describes the tachyon is not quite this object. It's actually gamma t of x plus c times psi m dm of t. Well, another way to, to write this is um, gamma plus c psi m km. So k is just the momentum acting on t. So this is the state which is in the comod. Or if you like the tachyon, the, the state which describes the tachyon is not just gamma minus a half. It's gamma minus a half plus C minus one D a half. Um, there's a nice way to write this state using superspace. So um, if we call, okay, let me erase this. If we define x as before to be equal to x plus gamma psi, then and c is equal to c plus kappa, sorry, gamma, this state here can be written as d kappa of um, c t of x. So to see how that works, d kappa, for people who know about superspace, is just like d d kappa. So the kappa can either come from this superfield or from the x superfield. If it comes from this superfield, then it just brings down a kappa. So this is equal to gamma t of ordinary x. And it comes from here, then it gives me, um, it gives me a c from here, and it gives me a d d x times psi. So that's precisely what we had here. So um, that's that's why you need these two terms. If you want to, if you want your your theory to be BRST invariant, it has to also have this this supersymmetry. So all the superfields are going to appear in that way. Okay, so that's the tachyon. So um, in the end, it looks nice. But it took more work, of course, than bosonic string. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Okay. So the simple. Okay. So, sorry. So the easiest way, without using operators, just to write everything in terms of modes. So this is like C N. A M, A P sum over, so you're going to get m, p, sum over m, n, and p, where, okay, in this case, n has to be equal to minus m, minus p. So that's the first term. You write, just write all the terms in terms of modes. That's the, if you like, the ugly way to do it. The nice way to do it is you have to know about how to compute um, operator product expansions in conformal field theory. So I didn't have time to do that, but if you do it in terms of operators, what you do is you you you'd find the Green's functions of these variables, 
And then you take the contour integral of Q. So Q is this uh, integral here. So you write, you can write Q is the contour integral of JBRST. And then if this is the state V, so V is this vertex operator, what you want to compute is you want to compute um, the contour integral of JBRST around this state here. So this is at z equals zero. So you need some contour that goes around z equals zero. And then you compute the contour by using the OPEs of the operators. So that's the way if you read Polchinski chapter four, that's how he'll tell you how to do it. And you can even do this in superspace if you want to be for the superstring, you can um, do an integral in superspace. Okay. dx dx acts like box because each dx is like um, it has an OPE with x which goes like 1 over z. So I'm not sure exactly what you're asking why dx dx goes like box, but it, it's because dx acts like a d dx. Is that? Um, so Okay, so I didn't do the conformal field theory here, but um, this is this is in Polchinski chapter four. Okay. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, let me just quickly do the Never Schwartz, and then we'll take a break. I mean the the massless, and then we'll take a break. So in the massless states. So this was the tachyon state. The more interesting state is the gluon. So here I have an AM and an AM prime. But it will turn out they will be related for the same reason that this BM was related to this T here. So the state for the gluon, it will turn out to get a contribution from here, which is gamma psi M AM of X. But then we'll also get a contribution from here, which will be C dxm am of x. But that's not enough. In fact, there's one other contribution it has to get, which comes from a term that, again, I didn't write down. But the other term you could write down, which has mass level uh, zero, is c minus one dm a half dn a half. So this is a two form because it has two indices. It's anti-symmetric in those indices. And so you can associate it with C, Psi M, Psi N. This is a two form. Let's call it FMN. And the reason why I chose that notation is because in the for this to be in the cohomology, it turns out this FMN has to be precisely the field strength associated to this. So you need another term here, which is Psi C, Psi M, Psi N dm of am. So this is the vertex operator for the gluon. And again, you can write it in this notation. So this was written as d t kappa c t. This one you can write as d kappa c times dx m am. Where again, the kappa, when you do the integral, can either come from the C, that gives you this term here. It can come from this dx, that gives you um, this term here. Or it can come from the x here. If it comes from the x here, then it means that it's going to pull the derivative of A, and that gives you this term here. Okay. So um, all of the massive states you can also describe in this language. Okay, so the states. The operator description is nice, but this is in the Never Schwartz sector. So after the break, we'll look at the Ramon sector, which is much messier. Um, okay, any questions for the break? So they have to be equal in order for this state to be annihilated by Q. Uh, sorry, so if, if B is, uh, if AM is in Lorentz gauge, then B doesn't come in. 
Any other questions? Okay, so let's take a break. Okay, so um, just going back to this. So there are, f f I guess, four possible cases. You could have p squared phi tilde 1 non-zero and this non-zero. That one we've already shown is BRST trivial. So if both of them are non-zero, you can always write phi tilde 1 is p slash or something. Then you could have p squared being non-zero, but p slash phi tilde 1 being zero. Or you could have p slash phi tilde 1, uh, p squared of phi tilde 1, 0, p slash phi tilde 1, non-zero. Or finally, you could have p squared phi tilde 1, 0, and p slash phi tilde 1, 0. Okay, so this one we already showed doesn't give any states in the cohomology. This one you can automatically rule out because if you hit p slash on this, you automatically get this 0. So this you don't have to worry about. So this is the one that we still have to show, okay? So to show this one, so let's suppose p slash phi 1 is non-zero, but p squared phi tilde 1 is zero. So what I claim is that you can always write phi 1 tilde in this form, where h is any vector Satisfying H and PM is zero. Uh, P is not zero. I have to divide by H dot P. Okay, so let's just show this. So so suppose P slash phi tilde one is non-zero. Okay, so this is non-zero. Now I'm going to hit with an H slash and then another P slash. So we know that P squared equals zero. So that means if I pull the P slash through the H slash, it annihilates the state because you get a p squared. So this object here is equal to the anti-commutator here, p slash with h slash is just 2 h dot p. So you get this is equal to 2 h dot p, so I guess I need a 2 over here, times uh, p slash phi tilde 1. So what have I shown? Oh, sorry. Um. So I, it seems I've shown, uh, sorry, I hit, show that phi tilde 1 is equal to, let's call this, no, I'm missing something. Okay, I still have three lectures, so. Okay, if anybody wants to figure this out before me, feel free to do it. <laughs> okay, so I haven't done that yet. Okay, so let's go now to the um, to the Ramon sector. Okay, so in the Ramon sector, now we have to worry about these square root cuts. So from our experience with the spinning particle, we know that there should be a spin one-half massless state. So let's first find that massless spin one-half state. I can erase all this because this is all useless now. So we have this state zero alpha, where the alpha is defined in the same way as we defined it for the spinning particle. So it comes from the d zeros.
And now we have to figure out ghost numbers and things like that. So if we wanted to be in the cohomology, it should have a C minus 1 or a gamma. Okay, so let's see what Q is. So I erased Q already. So we have Q equals C P plus X prime squared. Then there was a psi, psi prime. And then you have a gamma. So we want to um, we want to construct a state out of this zero alpha such that um, it's annihilated by this Q. Okay, so because this term here is going to be of the type C0 box, we clearly need to have a C minus 1. Otherwise, you're going to get the term from C minus 1 here, and that's going to give you problems, as before. But now you have to be worried about this gamma squared b. So we have to make sure that this doesn't contribute when it acts on this. Remember, in the neuver schwartz sector, that gave problems. The difference is that gamma in the Ramon sector, if you set this thing to 0, Um, the gamma zero here, um, these terms here will, will give you square root zero. So gamma has no zero mode part. I mean, there's no, if you write down gamma of zero, this is equal zero when z equals zero. It goes like square root of z. So um, this term here won't contribute just because gamma vanishes at z equals zero. Or more precisely, it goes like the square root of z. So this term won't kill it. But now if you try to write this kind of state in terms of operator language, we have a mess. So why? Because we need a, an operator here which has the property that um, gamma, when it approaches v, this goes like square root of z. Similarly, psi, when it approaches v, it's going to go like 1 over square root of z, so because of this term here. So this, ty this type of operators are called spin fields. They have the property that when an, uh, a, a field approaches it, it gives you square root cuts. Now, if you want to construct these operators explicitly, um, you have to do a procedure called bosonization. So I'm just going to write down the answer. So this was first described by Friedan Martinek Schenker. About um, 83, maybe 84. So they don't have a book, but they have, okay, there's a nuclear physics paper that is always cited. So this is the reference if you want to to learn how to describe the Ramon sector using this conformal field theory or operator language. Okay, so um, although in light cone gauge, Ramon sector is a little bit more complicated than the Never Schwartz, but not so much more complicated. If you want to use this covariant language, the Ramon sector is a mess. I mean, it's a it's an interesting mess. So. Um, these spin fields play a role in statistical mechanics, in Ising model, and things like that. But um, it's it's just a higher level of complication than what we're used to in the Neuver Schwartz sector. So I can write down what the states look like, but uh, I won't have time to explain. So what you have to do is you have to bosonize the gamma ghost, or if you like fermionize it, you have to 
Bose and I's the, the psi fields, you write them as something like e to the plus or minus sigma m. And then this v, turns out to have half integer powers of these phi. So you'll get things like this. And because of these half integer powers, that's what gives the square root cuts. So, um, so this was first worked out by Friedan Martinik Schenker. It's in Polchinski volume two, but I think Friedan Martinik Schenker do it better than Polchinski. I, mean, I think Polchinski got tired by the time he got to volume two. Um, so, so that's the reference I suggest. Um, but it's not something I want to get into here just because it would take the next three lectures to describe this. So, um, so the punchline is that the never schwartz sector is nice. I wrote down the vertex operators in a, I think, quite elegant way in terms of these, these types of operators. But when you want to describe the Ramon sector, we already saw it in the spinning particle that the Ramon sector, the cohomology is, is funny. Um, if I had done this carefully in the Never Schwartz sector for the string, you would see that the cohomology is precisely doubled, as it is in the bosonic string. But in the Ramon sector, it's not. It, again, it's, it's messy. So um, this is a problem if you want to describe, for example, Ramon Ramon backgrounds in string theory. So um, of course, for ADS, uh, five times S5 backgrounds, you need to turn on these Ramon Ramon fields. So the, 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 the terms which are in the closed string, which have these boundary conditions, both in left and right movement. And in fact, it's not known how to do that using this spinning string description. So this is called the spinning string or RNS string. So in fact, it's not yet the superstring. The reason why it's not yet the superstring is because in addition to this problem with the Ramon sector, you have to do a projection. So for example, this string theory, if you looked in the never short sector, there was a tachyon. Here was the tachyon vertex operator. There's nothing in the string theory that tells you that this is uh, somehow not there. But as you know from, I think, from Augusto's lectures is that in the superstring, there are no tachyons because you have space-time supersymmetry which implies that all of the states have non-negative mass square. Um, so in order to get to the superstring, you have to do something called the GSO projection. Which was understood after. So people studied this spinning string, Ramon, independently from Never Schwartz studied this string here, and then um, then th three physicists, um, Gliazzi, Shirk, and Olive, showed that if you do a certain projection, you find that the space-time spectrum is supersymmetric. So not only do you have, what I described earlier was supersymmetry, but on the world line, or on the world sheet. This supersymmetry here that I, um, for example, this kappa is a world sheet Grassmann coordinate. Now, what we're going to do for the rest of the lectures is discuss space-time supersymmetry, where um, the space-time supersymmetry transformation is not, so up to now we had a superfield of this type, where these, of course, are world sheet coordinates. So this is world sheet supersymmetry. It's not to be confused with space-time supersymmetry, where the space-time fields, like the gluon, is now a superfield. So people usually use theta for the space-time supersymmetry parameter, not kappa. So this would be something like am of x. And then you could have something like theta alpha times something which has a a vector and a spinner index. So you could have something like this. Kay. So these are space-time fields. There's a gluon, this would be the gluino, etc. Actually, the gluino is of course a spinner, so it's actually something like gamma m alpha beta chi beta x. Okay, so 
now we're going to shift. So why are we shifting gears is because although the RNS string is very powerful, people can use it um, to study many kinds of backgrounds of string theory, um, it has some unfortunate features. So one unfortunate feature is that the Ramon sector is complicated to describe. And in fact, if you want to turn on Ramon Ramon backgrounds, it's not known how to do it. And the other unfortunate feature is you have to do this GSO projection if you want to obtain the space-time supersymmetric spectrum. And that makes life complicated if you want to compute scattering amplitudes. So um, I think in the last lecture, I will say something about scattering amplitudes. But, but of course, if you do scattering of strings, you can start with the external strings be, for example, gluons. But if you want the theory to be space-time supersymmetric, you have to make sure that the tachyons and the other non-supersymmetric states decouple from the amplitudes. Otherwise, you're not going to get a supersymmetric amplitude. So in order to get this decoupling, you have to do something called summing over spin structures. What it means is that for the internal loops, you have to make sure that you include all the possible choices of boundary conditions. That's not easy to do. So it's done explicitly at one loop and at two loops, up to 4.2 loops, but nobody's done gone beyond two loops um, or four-point amplitudes. Um, what we'll describe now is a theory in which we know how to compute these amplitudes without doing a sum over spin structures essentially because there's no GSO projection. All the states in the theory are the space-time supersymmetric states. So essentially it's just the superstring states. We'll look at it first using this language of Green and Schwartz in which um, it's easy to compute the spectrum and show in light cone gauge that it reproduces what you want. But to compute amplitudes is complicated essentially because you're stuck in light cone gauge. Um, and then we'll discuss another formalism called this pure spinner formalism where we know how to quantize not just in light cone gauge. So we can compute the amplitudes in a covariant way. Okay, so, and of course, we can also use this theory to describe Ramon Ramon backgrounds. Okay, so that's the next half of the lectures, I guess. So uh, we'll discuss this space time supersymmetric version of this superstring. Okay, any questions before I start? So this, I, I did it without being careful. So there are five of these. So uh, actually, uh, of course, there are 10 of these, but half of them have a plus sign and half have a minus sign. So you have um, different choices here. Where the... Um, the different choices correspond to the same 32 different choices of the spinner as we had when I was describing the spinner in in this SU5 notation. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now we're going to learn something about space-time supersymmetry. Okay, so as I already, men as I already mentioned, the, the variables, instead of being x's and psi's, which carry vector indices, we're going to have an index uh, commuting variable xm and an anti-commuting theta alpha. And now we're going to use the notation where alpha is 1 to 16. So let me say what my notation is now. So in, of course, d equals 10, m equals 0 to 9. So this means this is a vial spinner. So when we're using this notation of, um, so of course, there are 32 different choices here. 
Now, if you remember how we defined these pluses and minuses, we defined them by splitting up the gamma matrices into gamma 1 plus I gamma 2. gamma 9. So if I'm working in Euclidean space, there's an I in front of all of these. If I'm working in Minkowski space, the last one, which I guess I should call it a 0, has no I. Okay, So these have the property that they all square to 0. And they satisfy, of course, the anti-commutations that gamma 1 plus I gamma 2 with gamma 1 minus I gamma 2, I guess is equal to 2 so this is a matrix, alpha, beta, delta, alpha, beta. And, sorry, this should be, um, no, okay, let's leave it like that. And these plus and minuses are the same ones as these. So this state plus, 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 plus would be annihilated by these with all the plus signs. And the minus, 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 minus would be annihilated by the ones with all the minus signs. So that's the notation I'm using, and these are the 32 components. Now, if you do a Lorentz transformation, a Lorentz transformation is generated not by a gamma matrix, by a product of two gamma matrices. So if you ask how a, a spinner transforms, under a Lorentz transformation, it transforms as uh, if gamma mn is the, Lorentz is, is the parameters of the Lorentz transformation, it transforms in this way. Maybe with a half. Where gamma mn is the anti-commutator of gamma m and gamma n. So it always involves a pair of gamma matrices. So because it always involves a pair of gamma matrices, it means that when you do a Lorentz transformation, this may, of course, change to another component, but it will always change to another component with two flips of signs. So this can either flip two plus signs to two minus signs, or it could flip one plus sign to a minus sign and one minus sign to a plus sign. Or, of course, it could flip two minus signs to two plus signs. But it's always going to flip the, the total number of signs by two. In, in other words, if you count the number of plus signs, if it starts out with an e even number of plus signs, after doing the Lorentz transformation, it still has an even number of plus signs, and vice versa. So that was the comment that Dennis made, that you have irreducible representations of the Lorentz group where this splits up into 16 and 16. So one of the 16s would be with an odd number of plus signs. So it could either have 5 or 3 or 1. So there's, of course, one component with all 5 being plus signs. There are 10 components with 3 plus signs. Because obviously this could be either the first and second index, first and third, first and fourth. And there are five with one plus sign. So this is, these are 16 components, which are, so let's call these vile. And then there are 16 anti-vile, which are just the ones with an even number of plus signs. So you could have um, plus, 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 plus minus. You could have two pluses and three minuses. Or you could have, of course, all minuses. So again, there's 1, 10, and 5. So the way I've written it, it's um, when you do this split, or this split here, the SO10 symmetry is broken down into U5. The manifest SO10 is broken to U5 where the U5 just rotates, which I'm calling the first, the second, third, or fourth, or fifth index. And these are representations of U5. So if I'm more careful, this is a 1, this is a 10, this is a 5 bar, and this is a 5, this is a 10 bar and 1, where 5 and 5 bar are just a fundamental and anti-fundamental of U5. Okay. And 10 would be the anti-symmetric product of two fives, and 10 bar would be the anti-symmetric product of two five bars. Kay. So this is just a little bit of group theory, but it's useful 
when we describe these spinners. So this would be a vial spinner. This would, by definition, it would have to have these components here. Okay. Now, of course, the Lorentz transformation involves two gamma matrices, so that takes this representation into the same representation. But if you act with a single gamma matrix, it takes this representation into this. Yeah. So the pluses and minuses refer to the eigenvalues. So these are um, matrices whose square is zero. And it can either, so gamma one, because gamma one plus I gamma two squared equals zero, it either annihilates this, I can think of it as a creation or an annihilation operator. So, of course, an anti-commuting uh, creation or annihilation. So the, um, if, it, if it acts as a creation operator, then I call it a plus. If it acts as an annihilation operator, I call it a minus. Yeah. So, for example, by definition, gamma 1 plus I gamma 2 would annihilate this state, but it would, uh, it would annihilate, in fact, all of these states, but it wouldn't annihilate, for example, this state. Because this has a minus here. It would act as a creation operator on this state. Yeah, so this is... Um, so I wrote this vertically and this horizontally, but what I meant to... Uh, so this is... tells you if gamma 1 plus I gamma 2 is creation or annihilation. And this one, for example, would be gamma 9 plus I gamma 10. Hmm. Yeah, so each of these are a different state. So this would be one component of the spinner. This would be another component of the spinner. So each of these are different components of the spinner. <coughs> Why, so I'm trying to define for you how the gamma matrices act on the different components of theta alpha. So theta alpha has 16 components. And the way I'm defining the different components is I'm telling you how these gamma matrices act on the different components. So if I choose... I'm choosing this description of my different components um, using this notation. So this component is defined to be annihilated by gamma 1 plus I gamma 2, gamma 3 plus I gamma 4, gamma 9 plus I gamma 10. Whereas this one is annihilated by the first one, gamma 1 plus I gamma 2, gamma 3 plus I gamma 4, gamma 5 plus I gamma 6, but not by the last two. It will be annihilated not by gamma 7 plus I gamma eight, but annihilated by gamma seven minus I gamma eight. So it's a different choice of which are creation and annihilation. So let's just do an example. Suppose I act with gamma one plus I gamma two on a spinner with this component here. Okay. So let's say um, psi. So what that means is that um, I'm computing this object here. But I want this beta to be this component here. So it's plus, plus, plus. So that's just my notation for beta. By definition, this is zero. Okay, so for any alpha, this gives you zero. Let's suppose we chose a minus here. Then it's not zero. What it's going to give me is the, the component of this which is non-zero is this. It's minus plus, 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 plus. So this is what I'm calling alpha. And plus, 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 plus. So this component of gamma 1 minus I gamma 2 is non-zero. It will take uh, a spinner of the plus, 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 and turn it into one of minus plus, 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 plus. So it takes one of these into one of these, right? Takes it into this one. So the gamma matrix is going to take this, a spinner which is vial, into a spinner which is antivial. Okay. So this is just notation. But notation is going to be useful um, if we want to understand how the gamma matrices act on these spinners. Okay. Um, you'll see more of this later. Um, so, but I just want to introduce you to it now so you get an idea of what's coming later. Okay, so this vial spinner is, 
is one of these. Okay. Okay, now we want to define what we mean by space-time supersymmetry. So I'm going to tell you how these transform under space-time supersymmetry. So if you've learned four-dimensional supersymmetry, it's very similar. So you want delta theta alpha to be equal to a constant. So this is now global space-time supersymmetry. And the transformation of x is going to involve epsilon and theta. And I just want to get the sign right. Um, so if I use the same sign as it's in the notes here, it transforms in this way. So if you're if you know four dimensional supersymmetry, the only difference is this gets replaced by Pauli matrices in four dimensions. So epsilon, of course, also has sixteen components, and this gamma matrix, of course, just tells you uh, how the x transforms in terms of theta. So this transformation has the property that if you do it twice, you get a translation. So if I call this transformation Q and I do delta Q1, delta Q2, acting on, for example, theta, you'll get zero because epsilon is, of course, a constant, so it doesn't transform. So this is zero. But if you act on it on Xm, you'll get delta Q1. So delta Q2 of Xm will give you one-half theta alpha, gamma m, alpha beta, epsilon 2. And now if I act with delta Q1 on this, using this transformation of theta, you're going to get 1 half epsilon 1 alpha, gamma m, alpha beta, epsilon 2. So that's if I do it in one order. So first the delta Q2 and then the delta Q1. Now if I switch the order, so this is delta, just one of them. If I switch the order, I, of course, get the same thing with these exchange. So this is 1 half epsilon 2 alpha, gamma m alpha beta, epsilon 1 alpha. And now if I subtract the two to get the commutator, you get 1 half epsilon 2 gamma m epsilon 1 minus epsilon 1 epsilon 2. Epsilon is an anti-commuting variable because theta is an anti-commuting variable. And it turns out gamma m is a symmetric matrix. So this is equal to plus the delta factor of a half. So the commutator of two supersymmetries is just a translation as you expect in supersymmetry. So in supersymmetry, the algebra is Q alpha with Q beta is equal to gamma M alpha beta times D dx M. And that's precisely what these transformations reproduce. Okay, okay so space-time supersymmetry, if you haven't, how many people have seen this before? Okay, good. Okay, so I assume the only thing new is you haven't seen it in 10 dimensions, I assume. So you've seen it. The people, has anybody seen it in any dimension except for 4? How many people have seen it in 10? Okay. Okay, so it's the same algebra, but of course now the gamma matrices are different. Okay, okay so what we're going to do, so I'll just write down something here and we'll continue it next time is we're going to first to describe something called the superparticle. So again, this is in the notes that was, um, it appeared on HEP maybe two weeks ago. It's 1711. Uh, 
uh, there were copies that were printed out yesterday. Um, so the idea is to construct a generalization of the massless particle action we described before. So the particle we described before was just this. This action is not invariant under this transformation because when you transform x, you're going to get something proportional to theta dot, just from this transformation. But you can make it supersymmetric by adding a term here. So the term you add is, um, let's get the signs right. It involves thetas in such a way that when you transform theta by epsilon, this transformation here is going to cancel the transformation coming from x dot here. And what we're going to do is, so this is called Brink-Schwartz superparticle. What we're going to find is that when we quantize this, we don't get a massless scalar. We get, in fact, a whole multiplet of fields which describe d equals 10 super Yang mills, which is, of course, the massless states of the superstring, of the open superstring. So this is going to be the starting point of the superstring, in the same way as the relativistic particle was the starting point for the bosonic string because, because of the tachyon in the bosonic string. So in some sense, the tachyon in the bosonic string is now going to be replaced by this super Yang mills multiplet for the superstring. Okay, well, it turn out that quantization of this is not so easy. And in fact, um, uh, if you do it, try to do it directly, it's complicated to do it except in light cone gauge. And then we'll find that there's some trick to be able to quantize it covariantly, and that will lead to pure spinners. Okay, so that's the, the things that I'll do in the next lecture. Okay, so I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Yeah. P is invariant under this transformation. It turns out that what? Um, so you're asking why is this action invariant if P is if transformation of P is zero, or why do I define this way? So I'm defining this to be the supersymmetry transformation of P. I mean, the only thing that the transformations have to satisfy is this algebra here. And this is consistent. P is the same thing like ddx. So because Q alpha commutes with ddx in the supersymmetry algebra, that's why you want Q to commute with PM. So. Any other questions?